Uh, welcome to the channel. Another drawing day today, January 16th, 6.31 p.m. I'm reading from William James, The Variety of Religious Experience. James was the head of the psychiatric psychology philosophy department at Harvard. He was born in 1842, and this book was published in 1902, Varieties of Religious Experience, A Study in Human Nature. And this is from uh, the chapter on the religion of healthy mindedness. And this passage is from a poem by Walt Whitman. I could turn and live with animals. They are so placid and self-contained. I stand and look at them long and long. They do not sweat and whine about their condition. They do not lie awake in the dark and weep for their sins. Not one is dissatisfied. Not one is demented with the mania of owning things. Not one kneels to another, nor to his kind that lived thousands of years ago. Not one is respectable or unhappy over the whole earth. <clears throat> James writes, no natural pagan could have written these well-known lines. But on the other hand, Whitman is less than a Greek or a Roman, for their consciousness, even in Homeric times, was full to the brim of the sad mortality of this sunlit world, and such a consciousness Walt Whitman resolutely refuses to adopt. When, for example, Achilles, about to slay Lycaon, Priam's young son, hears him sue for mercy, he stops to say, Ah, friend, thou too must die. Why thus lamentest thou? Patroclus, too, is dead. Who was better far than thou? Over me, too, hang death and forceful fate. There cometh morn or eve or some noonday when my life, too, some man shall take in battle, whether with spear he smite or arrow from the string. Then Achilles savagely severs the poor boy's neck with his sword, heaves him by the foot into the scamander, and calls to the fishes of the river to eat the white fat of Lycaon. Just as here the cruelty and the sympathy each sing, ring true and do not mix or interfere with one another, so did the Greeks and Romans keep all their sadness and gladness unmingled and entire. Instinctive good they did not reckon sin, nor had they any such desire to save the credit of the universe as to make them insist, as so many of us insist, that what immediately appears as evil must be good in the making, or something equally ingenious. Good was good and bad just bad for the earlier Greeks. They neither denied the ills of nature. Walt Whitman's verse, what is called good is perfect and what is called bad is just as perfect would have been mere silliness to them. Nor did they, in order to escape from those ills, invent, quote, another and a better world, unquote, of the imagination, in which, along with the ills, the innocent goods of sense would also find no place. This integrity of the instinctive reactions, this freedom from all moral sophistry and strain, gives a pathetic dignity to ancient pagan feeling. And this quality Whitman's outpourings have not got. His optimism is too voluntary and defiant. His gospel has a touch of bravado and an affected twist. And this diminishes its effect on many readers who yet are well disposed towards optimism. And on the whole, quite willing to admit that in important respects, Whitman is of the genuine lineage of the prophets.